title of this talk is uh, yet again about data science with game theory. I'll call it data science with game theory flavor. And uh, I I've been involved with research related this uh, synergy with computer science and game theory for many years by now. And this particular initiative started already six, seven years ago when I returned from my previous period in industry, long time with industry. Uh, where basically uh, 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 my feeling was that uh, classical uh, data science algorithms, I call it data science, because I refer to the real practical things that are used in IR, applied ML, and some things in NLP and recommendation systems actually need to be revisited. So I talk about a very bottom up approach, really taking a very, very basic algorithms to search, recommendation, prediction and more, and the claim is that need to be revolutionized. And I try to illustrate it in a very brief talk, you know, one or two examples. And I just like to say that in general, if I had to have a much longer talk, I need to talk about two perspectives uh, at least. One of them is what we call the agent perspective, but we talk about predictions, pigmentation, persuasion, but in competitive environments. And the other one is what I like to call the mediator perspective. Mediator is a thing that I worked for many years by now. But when you talk about mediators, the mediator is Google, is Facebook, is Amazon, or whatever, where many publishers or whatever come and they are uh, have their own incentives, and you need to mediate it the way, one way or another. And in both of them, the claim is this particular notion of incentives need to be really integrated in a very basic algorithms and they are, they, I'll be happy when we actually replace the current algorithms. So a word about the agent story, I'll try to be very brief and I know how much I managed to do, but I'll try. So the agent story is the following one. Here is a nice lady, her name is Gal, and uh, Gal need to choose among two, uh, two uh, um, applications that are very popular these days of guessing, uh, guessing uh, your age. And one application guesses that her age is 24 and one says that her age is 34. And as you know, Gal is a very confident woman and therefore probably she'll choose 34 because her age is 36. So it's, you know, this one wins. And from this point on, she actually will use this application. That's, that's the reality. Uh, so this refers to a notion that I've been involved with people in theoretical computer science already 10 years ago that we call dueling algorithms. We don't not need to go over all of this slide. Basically, we say the classical algorithms basically try to minimize some, uh, some error, average error, some expectation. While in stochastic process and in reality, in many cases, you care about the probability of being better than the other. So think about, we'll be more specific. You have many users, users come to you. And you know, if, you, if uh, Bob with the new algorithm will compete with the classic algorithm, Alice will be better predictor for you, then you probably tell your friends. And basically, you basically try to compete and be better than Alice on most of the instances. Anyway, I don't like to take a position here, but there is some trade-off between optimiz optimizing instances to optimizing plots. So that's very theory kind of thing, but it really connects very, very directly to data science kind of thing, because we have a very similar situation in our data science applications. We just don't have access to the distribution. Uh, for example, in the regression task, we may have access only to sample of points, uh, instances, labels, and the corresponding component predictions, I'll be more specific. So I'll give an example from the early parts of this work with uh, my student, Omer ben uh, So that's, uh, that's a very early work on that subject that we did. So think about a realistic system. This is the Boston, uh, Boston uh, apartment kind of database that you need to basically predict the apartment value based on certain parameters. Here we just assume, let's assume that it depends only on the apartment size. And Alice is the standard algorithm that use some, let's say just some linear regression for a minute. And Bob need to respond to it, to apply a best response to it. So the key issue here is that you need to respond. There are some points that you'll be better, closer to Bob, and some that we are closer to Alice. And basically when you respond, you like to design, you have access to some points that you see what was the reality and how Alice behaves. You can try it. 
And then for new users, most of the users didn't show yet, you'd like to be a better predictor for something that will come in the future. So let's formalize it a little bit. So the model is, it start, it's entering to classical park learning model. It enters already some notions that come from games, but uh, as you see, these are very practical ones. There are instance domains, some subset of R, of R N, a label domain, some Y, and Alice is using a strategy H bar, uh, which is some hypothesis in fact, unknown to Bob. And there is a joint distribution over the following triplet the instances, the labels, and the disparity of Alice. How much Alice was wrong on this kind of things, or is wrong with her algorithm. This distribution is unknown, but Bob can access, this actually happens in the real applications, the, uh, has access to uh, a sequence of examples that come from this distribution. This is all, all that he has. So Bob's payoff, if he chooses an hypothesis of strategy age against this age bar is just the probability that its disparity or his disparity or his algorithm disparity will be lower than Alice's uh, disparity. So you can define now the classical empirical payoffs given a sequence S of, or, or a sample Bob empirical payoff is just the sum of points that he is better on it or the average number of points that is better than Alice on this sample set. And we'll call H star an empirical best response or EBR if you just, this is the hypothesis or strategy that maximize uh, this payoff. Now we can ask the classical question, should Bob employ, Bob employ an empirical best response? And we have the classical problem, maximizing the empirical payoff might result in overfitting and the solutions restrict the strategy space and so on and so forth. But what we'd like to emphasize in this first part of the talk, we'll get to game theory <laughs> somewhat later, is that already we have a problem here of best response. Given a strategy set H, which may say, we say that some small H in H is an epsilon best response if for every H, H prime in H, it holds that what you actually get in your, uh, or, or your payoff is epsilon close to what you obtain is in, in this H, H prime. So you are epsilon uh, optimal. And the objective is given this general hypothesis space, level and approximates best response efficiently with high probability. That's the first step that you need to solve in order to get to, 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 to be frank in real application, even in, in many cases, it's also the last step, but we'll talk about uh, uh, the multi-agent setting as well. And in this particular problem, the results were characterization of the pack level strategy sets via the notion of visit I mentioned, full analysis for linear predictors, and experimental results showing that we actually can defeat uh, algorithm, classical algorithms in a realistic setting using this approach. When I said best linear response, I'd like to give you an example of things that we did. I talked just on linear systems in order to be that to illustrate these things. But even this setting is not that naive because Alice can be a complex neural net. And all that we need is an access to a sample of the points of her predictions. Uh, we don't need to say that it's a linear predictor, although if we know what is the power of Alice, we can do something else that I'll mention in a minute. So, so what will be a theorem here? So that's one of our theorems. Given epsilon and delta, we run the uh, EBR algorithm, the empirical best result algorithm on that number of points, M points, sample points, where sample I idea from this uh, D, from this distribution on the triplets. And after time, this is polynomial in M, M is the number of points in the sample. It outputs H star such that probability at least minus delta, we have a something which is epsilon best response. What we mean is, that for reasonable uh, systems, we can actually uh, uh, have this kind of, of, of result. And later we need approximation and stuff like that. So just to illustrate you what is going on here, just that, that not, it's not a technical talk really, but, but I'd like to illustrate what is going on here. Think about Alice as a very simple uh, uh, regression kind of algorithm. You're just using A bar X plus B bar to, be, to, to predict Y. 
And there are three points. So Alice's uh, line here is appears here on, on the screen. And it's a point in the parameter space, A, B, A bar, B bar. Now, what happens for each point, there are two parallel hyperplanes that in between them, you are better predictor than, than Alice, if you, if you like to compute the best response. And this, this goes for any pair of points. But what we get here is what is called a, par, a hyperplane arrangement with many regions. It turns out there are not too many regions and that you can go over these regions and that's the algorithm and select a point from each of these regions and until you select the region when you win the largest amount of points. That's the idea. The large, and this region defines to you some A star B star, which is the best response. That's the idea in a very simplified uh, setting for this best response algorithm. And this can go far when we make to more complicated settings. But I'd like to make a comment. One thing that I started with is, which I would criticize, is what about Alice? Uh, you know, here, there are well-defined algorithms. You may be very bad predictor for particular instances. So it turns out that this type of algorithm can be strengthened if Alice's power is similar to Bob's, uh, to Bob's power to our best response power. What I mean by that, for this particular example of linear systems, assume Alice uses a linear predictor, then the EBR algorithm can be adjusted to output H star such that it will be as before, but performs arbitrary close to the opponent's strategy in the classical setting, in the classical mean square error or mean average error setting that you use while having the same runtime complexity. So we have some positive news here that we tried on in various kinds of setting. I started with in Boston, which is simple database, but statisticians love it. So I'll not go over this, uh, uh, this uh, what it means is, what it's quoted here is that these are the results. Basically any number that you see here, which is uh, above 0.5 means that this is better than Alice, uh, Alice game, which means this is the proportion of users that you'll be better uh, for them. And there are various kinds of settings that have been studied here. And these numbers is the ratio between what happens under the classical uh, optimization criteria or mean square O in average error and the factor close to one means that even on this factor you don't lose. So you are behaving like similar to the classical algorithm if you wish, but you win a much larger proportion of these users. And this has many, as we know from real applications that we are involved with is a dramatic amplification. Many of the users try only once these two systems or whatever and decide what to do. Okay, one word about game theory in this kind of example and the other example that I give on our agenda will be much more game theoretic. Uh, work on dueling algorithms that we've involved already 10 years ago has been extended to best response, from best response analysis to mean max strategies in a game. So, it's not the case that you need to give bad response and the other guy just sits there. So if you, if you, uh, if you now make a better search engine for, for, for Bing by being a better ranker, so Google may respond. And similarly, work on best response regression has been extended to what we call regression equilibria. Just to give you the following, because this is a very applied kind of, uh, of uh, motivation. The, the fact that it's, it's, it's needed Think about a cloud provider, a big one, that basically needs to provide prediction services to several competing parties. So you may, he, he, this company, this huge company, should think about uh, how they respond to one another. If you have something which can satisfy several uh, users like that, and here comes the idea of regression equilibria, but they will not get into it. So back to the bigger agenda. The big, big agenda here is called data science with uh, meets game theory. And in fact, what is written here is the kind of concrete problems in IR, applied ML, exploration, exploitation, whatever that we face with. And we just gave you an example of what one of the examples that fit into the agent perspective. I'd like to best respond to a classical algorithm. And, you know, and, and, and basically the fit. Now we'd like to give an example of the mediator perspective. The media story is huge. 
because when you talk about mediators, we can talk for many times and for a lot of time, and much of this has to do with the power of mediators. So we worked on in the past in our, uh, under the game theory hat under various kinds of mediators. Mediators that can enforce some kind of behavior like in social laws for artificial agent societies. Mediators that just put the, the setting like in programs or whatever. But, and mediators that can recommend. So the issue here for me is that I see mediators everywhere on the web. And actually many of them should be revisited given the GT flavor. And I'll report on one of them that I've been working more than others because it already showed uh, some practical success and it's a it's a i, I owe I owe you a lot to my colleagues in the information retrieval community that i learned from them a lot so our example will be we'll take a, a, a smaller uh, a smaller uh, theoretical example or stylus example but the actual example that we care what are rankers so for example let, let's take the following quote from Google South. It's written here there that in a fraction of the second, Google search algorithms so put hundreds of billions of pages in, in, the, in the search engine to find the most relevant, useful results for your, what you are looking for. And in fact, that, that's true, it's wonderful. But as you can see, if you look at that, if you work on, on that in the industry, at the end, you have your again. The publishers use strategies, which are the documents they write, and their payoff are basically at least partially determined by the ranking for different queries. There is a ranking function that is used by, med by a mediator. This mediator is conceptually very simple. It's highly complicated. It does something very efficiently, but it actually implements what is called the probability ranking principle, PRP. Uh, if you look at NLP, by the way, that's my what I'm doing in the last year, it's you have embedding for this and embedding for this, and then left at the closer one, but at the end, it's the probability ranking principle. The PRP, the most central concept in professional retrieval, states the document should be ranked by the relevant probabilities and care about the highest ranked documents. And it's not trivial. In the paper already six years by now, I feel all this, it turns out that the PRP fails miserably in what is called adversarial error setting. As publishers, our search engine optimizer, and search engine optimization is one of the biggest industry that we have. Because they optimize their utility, it can be shown that if you formalize it a bit, and if often, even if you experiment with it, it can be shown that in equilibrium, they will tend to write on similar or popular subjects, you know it from the TV channels, of course, ignoring others, which will at the end decrease the total user social welfare. And in some general settings under other ranking function, employing well-defined randomness in the ranking can be proved to be better with regard to social user welfare inequity. That, that, these are big claims. So I'd like to illustrate it to you. I just to say that someone would like to, to, to read about this. I, I look, I, I, there are many papers that we have here. Most of them are with IR guys and in IR uh, forms. Uh, and I, 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 if you like to read something without much IR, then I refer to you to the CACN paper from 2019 that actually talked about rethinking search engine and recommendation system in game theoretic perspective uh, that will, will describe to the theory and practice there. Here I'll again talk about a paper that talk about recommendation systems. I fully agree with Michael said before, you know, the computation is a big thing, the ecosystem recommendation systems that illustrate to you the same kind of phenomena in recommendation systems. So think about blogs, again, realistic uh, situation. People need to decide, there are bloggers that need to decide on the type of content to write. And there are users, and there is something that connects them, which is, let's call it satisfaction matrix. If you write about, uh, write about a particular content and the user likes it, then he, he or she will click. So think about these numbers. Player one or publisher one can write about content X1 or X2, while player two can write only about content X3. And what will happen here? Let's assume the player one will write about content X1 and see what happened here. Okay, the classical system, the PRP, the top system, will give it, you know, the, the user that the content which is most satisfying. 
the social welfare will be, you can sum up two. And, but player one is happy. Let's assume that he just like to maximize impressions for this stock. It has two users. Notice that if he would uh, write on that content, the social welfare will be higher, but he will be less happy because you'll get only one user. So the question again is, what should you do? What, what is fair here? What is the dynamics here? What is the user utility or so on? Should we talk about price of anarchy or whatever? So the approach that we have taken because we wanted to come with a concrete suggestion is like, first the model, the model really states in what we said before, you have a set of users, a set of players, player J selects one item from the set of possible content, content types. There are profiles as a game theorist, which is the strategy profiles are the possible content types. Each user has a satisfaction function from each content that has particular satisfaction. And the mediator, resume mediator, take this tuple of qualities and decide which one to show. Uh, perhaps it can decide not to show anything. And the payoff is just the expected number of uh, 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 times that your, your content is exposed, basically. That's, that's no one will argue almost with that. So, that's, that's the model. And what can we do now? What will be a good system? I've shown you that there is some issue with social welfare versus, I don't know, uh, the success of publishers. So basically we start, start with desired properties. One is called fairness, which I don't like now this term fairness because term fairness is, is used for real things, important things. You know, no one will argue with our fairness properties. Fairness properties here, the, the most extreme one here says leader multiplicity. The most satisfying items are displayed with higher probabilities than the least satisfying items. So it's something that is minimal. Don't be crazy in your, in your uh, uh, properties uh, or with symmetry. If, if this publisher is fully symmetric as far as satisfying the users, they'll be shown with the same probability. The other one, is a big lesson from the many years in the ad industry is called stability. You'd like the system will be stable. You don't like it fluctuate all of the time and people will send, change the content every, every minute, in minute. It means that any, under any set of players, users and items, the induced game should possess a pure Nash equilibrium. In fact, you'd like more. You'd like that any dynamics here will converge to some equilibrium that will not get into crazy fluctuations. So basically, we started with these properties, and we'd like to find a mediator that satisfies these properties. And immediately, when we put the, this assumption with a call completeness, that we saw, show an item with displayed with probability one, we get an impossibility theorem that says no mediator can satisfy fairness, stability, and completeness. And in fact, this rule out also the PRP that you know, it, it cannot work, it doesn't satisfy fairness and stability, and we should uh, try a different approach. And one of the lessons that I like to give in the very few minutes that I have is this approach that I think it can go far. I call it the Shapley mediator. Uh, basically, bear with me. We focus on the arbitrary user, U, and strategy profile X, which is a tuple of content. Now, given a subset of the players or subset of the content, C, we can define XC to be a restriction of this profile to the entries in C. So user I satisfaction from the items in the players in C is naturally defined as the maximal satisfaction from this content. So that's all very natural, but in fact, notice that in use a cooperative game, you have, a, you have the all possible coalitions and you have a number at end, which is associated with each, uh, with each coalition. And you can look at the Shapley value and basically, the Shapley mediator will be the mediator that set display probabilities according to the Shapley value. It will call the Shapley mediator. And this Shapley mediator has nice properties. It satisfies fairness. Then it also turns out that the game induced by Shapley mediator is a potential game. So this means that any better response dynamic converge. So it satisfies fairness and stability. So the other context as a computer scientist I've seen sharply used, typically there is a problem because in general computation of the Shapley value is sharply hard. 
but anyway, like to be particle. So in this setting, computing these pair probabilities under the Shackley mediator can be done in linear time. So we are good. In fact, we have nice mechanisms. And if you like to be a theorist for a minute, and you like, you believe in efficiency, uh, defined as the display probability is the maximum satisfaction level. In fact, you get that the only mechanism satisfying fairness, stability, and efficiency is the Shapley mediator. And to the game theorists among us, there are many, I hope, this is not the result of the Shapley characterization. It's a different characterization of, of, of the Shapley. So, so this is more or less what I wanted to say, but I'd like to emphasize more now about few minutes about the general picture. So we have many aspects, very realistic aspects where game theory, and I call it data science, not because I'm not a statistician, but uh, I think I'd like to, didn't want to call it just machine learning, you call it applied machine learning. I've seen it mostly in IR, in NLP, and also in things related to uh, explore and exploit. One of the things that I, if I had a few more minutes, I will tell you that another type of mediator is like ways or whatever that need to mix exploration and exploitation. Here there is another issue, the people that does the exploration is the audience. And I guess that many of you, when you go to a recommendation going somewhere, you may have refused it because I say it's probably just an exploration. So we need to solve this problem. So there are many concrete problems that come into play in search, in recommendation systems, in regression, in segmentation, and all of them has concrete issues that we really need to bring into practice. I think it will be better for the social welfare. So I'll finish with a practical side and say, what if this is implemented somewhere? So we can implement and already implemented some best response AI services for prediction, segmentation, persuasion. We didn't talk about persuasion today. Uh, and another thing, which is that the robust third recommendation ecosystem, basically it means that it's an ecosystem that takes into account uh, the publisher incentives, the user incentive, and everyone, and like every, all of this to live together. Uh, other thing that we didn't manage to talk, and we are involved with this, is in welfare maximizing ex explore and explore services. And I think the best is that I'll, I'll just stop here. <laughs>